The post-it notes covered with Lucy Letby's minutes crawls are the closest thing to a confession of her evil thoughts and intentions that she is ever going to make. These bits of evidence may have been intentionally hidden for police to uncover in her semi-detached Chester home on Westbourne Road in an indirect but purposeful effort to put a stop to her murdering spree. According to detectives, Despite my admiration for the police department's meticulous investigation into this horrific murderer, I must disagree with their assessment. Simply put, the scrawled notes offer a window into Lucy Letby's mind. My job as a forensic psychiatrist is to treat and rehabilitate people who some refer to as being criminally insane, many of whom commit crimes like robberies, rapes, and even murders. My job requires me to travel the nation's high-security jails, secure medical wards, and testify as an expert witness inside courtrooms. I've researched four ladies who killed infants over my career. They were all experiencing such acute psychotic illusions that they were unable to maintain a sense of reality. That is not what these post-it notes show us. There is no proof of a severe mental disorder that may lessen Letby's criminal responsibility here. The manifestations of self-hatred, remorse, humiliation, and self-loathing, as well as a lack of confidence what psychiatrists refer to as negative cognitions do jump out at me. It may be found in statements like I don't deserve mum plus dad, hate myself, I am a horrible evil person, I don't deserve to live and the world is better off without me. She has annotated the green note with the following words in big letters. No hope, despair, panic, fear, and lost. Such eruptions can be explained by combining two overlapping causes. The first is a sliver of understanding that what she has done is too horrible to fang. Even if this in no way lessens the evil of her deeds. There are no words, she claims. I am a terrible person, and I suffer every day as a result. She seemed to be experiencing some remorse, even if it conflicts with what she was really doing to those babies. Possibly as a result, the words are crammed onto such little bits of paper. They stand in for her self-pity as well as her extremely little and constrained conscience. She didn't feel enough guilt to deter her from killing more people or to force her to confess at the trial. But it doesn't imply there wasn't some conflicting thought in the back of her head. The second hypothesis is that these frenetic scrolls clearly display symptoms of despair and anxiety. Such unfavorable thoughts are a typical depressive symptom. She probably had no idea what she was getting into when she started writing on these post-it notes. She may have started out intending to only scribble down a few ideas before they flew out of her in this frantic and perhaps cathartic rush. One of them is titled Not Good Enough. The repetitive loops and letters, the superimposed help and hate in bold black writing, and the general intensity are all indications of a mind in conflict. But even if she had depression, the symptoms were not severe enough to prevent her from carrying out daily tasks. She didn't appear overly anxious to her hospital co-workers, despite having a demanding job caring for newborns who were purportedly on the verge of death. There are several contradicting ideas. I haven't done anything wrong, she writes, but she eventually confesses. I am evil. I took action. It is obvious that good and wrong are at war. Of course, we know who prevailed. I've witnessed instances when criminals afterwards convince themselves that the crimes they recall never took place. Lucy Letby is not faithful to that. She is fully convinced of her own falsehoods and the notion of her innocence. And she feels resentful that anybody should have any doubts about them. She knows in her heart that she murdered those seven infants and injured many more. But she is also fully certain that she is innocent. This is a well-known paradox among many people who perpetrate less serious crimes, such financial fraud. Even though they have gotten away with it for so long, they believe it would be unfair for anybody to charge them. It's a form of narcissistic entitlement, the idea that one is exempt from the rule of law. Additionally, there is proof of clinical psychopathy. She committed crimes that had never been committed before. In other words, but it does not automatically make her a psychopath.
She wasn't sexually promiscuous, for instance. Nor does it appear that she is typically a parasitic and deceitful person in many facets of her life, which are some of the more typical ones that seem to be lacking. She lied repeatedly to the police and during her trial, but there was a good reason for it. She was attempting to cover up her crimes. These notes provide no indication that the author fabricates a story or lies only for the pleasure of doing so. She could be aware that what she did was immoral, at least as a matter of fact. We refer to this ability to recognize when others are suffering as cognitive empathy. She obviously lacks emotive empathy, though, and is unable to understand how other people feel. She is not made to suffer by their suffering. In fact, she finds some pleasure in it. I've devoted hours to attempting to comprehend Letby's motivations. One statement in particular has drawn the attention of several experts. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them. But accepting that at face value is a mistake. It is merely a self-pitying scream and not an explanation. Power, control, and the rush of being around the mourning process, in my opinion, are her primary driving forces. The statements I'll never have children or marry. I'll never know what it's like to have a family provide signs of virulent resentment or jealousy towards the content family unit. Even though the lost babies were not her own patients, it is known that Letby wanted to be there for grieving parents. Even after killing one family's preterm infant, she sent them a sympathy card. Obviously, there is a pathological need to profit from their suffering. She is not, however, immune to feeling. Letby frequently scribbles the names of her cats, Tigger and Smudge, especially on a sheet that has been torn from a notebook and is tightly covered on both sides. She could express her feelings of care and emotion towards the animals while yet maintaining total control. The most exceptional and distinctive clinical case I have seen was Lucy Letby. According to what is known about her life, Nobody found anything unusual about her until questions concerning the newborn death started to be asked. She wasn't impulsive or violent, suspicious or cantankerous. She was regarded by co-workers as knowledgeable and conscientious, as well as polite and personable. I don't think we'll ever comprehend her in its entirety. She is unlikely to receive the type of intense psychological care that may result in genuine remorse because she will never be allowed to leave jail. It's quite improbable that she would have an insight that would explain what she had done without that. These strange post-it notes are the only window into her warped, poisoned psyche that we are ever likely to see.